William Randolph Hearst. He was a media mogul of unmatched power and influence. In the 1920s, Hearst destroyed celebrity reputations and careers with the scandals and rumors he turned into headlines. But in 1924, 61-year-old William Randolph Hearst himself was caught up in a shocking tale of sex, booze, and murder. On this episode of Mysteries and Scandals, we'll piece together the events of a doomed weekend aboard the Hearst yacht. Silent screen legend Charlie Chaplin, Hearst's longtime mistress, movie star Marion Davies, gossip columnist Luella Parsons, and Hollywood producer Thomas Ince made up the list of passengers. But on this cruise, the social activities included infidelity and death. Hearst, who for whatever reasons of that weekend's events, um, was growing, growing increasingly jealous of Chaplin and what might be going on. And Hearst was extremely upset after finding who he thought to be Chaplin and Miriam and, and pulled out his gun and shot. What really happened on that weekend cruise and was there a cover-up involving some of the most powerful people in Hollywood? If they were to come forward and uh, blow the whistle on this kind of thing, they would be finished. There's a certain morbid appeal to uh, seeing the high and mighty brought down to their knees. I'm A.J. Benza. Join me as we attempt to set the record straight about one of Hollywood's most mysterious deaths and the man suspected of murder, William Randolph Hearst. In the 1920s, publishing giant William Randolph Hearst reigned over 28 newspapers and more than a dozen magazines. Hearst specialized in the sensational or yellow journalism style of the late 19th century. He printed any scandals and half-truths that would sell the most papers. Writer Stephen Peros based his play, The Cat's Meow, on the escapades of William Randolph Hearst. He had the kind of power that no one has had before or since. He controlled newspapers in just about every city in the country. He was an opinion maker. I mean, he could virtually make or break reputations. And in some cases, he could even start a war if, if um, he wanted the um, American public opinion to, to get behind a certain cause. And that's exactly what he did. In 1898, the Spanish-American War was in many ways fueled by the Hearst Press. Biographer Ben Proctor recalls Hearst's flair for creating hysteria. It became known as hysteria in trying to win circulation battle, which he did win. He, he snooped, scooped, and stooped to conquer. This is a, but it's the greatest historical fiction you will ever read. It is an exciting paper. His famous quote, um, about the Spanish-American uh, War, um, when this reporter said, there's no war here, he said, you send the, you send the pictures, I'll, I'll make the war. When Hearst wasn't causing trouble, he was certainly asking for it. Married and the father of five children, Hearst wasn't the stay-at-home type. Edward Epstein is the author of The Ince Affair. He loved showgirls. In the old days, Marion Davies was a special one. She was barely a teenager, but he fell in love with her. This was uh, to turn out to be a lifetime relationship with each of them jealous of the other, which would create a problem in the future. But in the beginning, Hearst was madly in love and would do anything for his mistress. The 54-year-old mogul used his power to advance the career of the 20-year-old beauty. Bob Bertrand is a film historian. Marion Davies was, a, was an actress in, in New York, and, and Hearst became her champion and produced a number of films. Hearst very much wanted to make Marion Davies a star. He was smart enough to know that while he might be a genius in the newspaper field, he needed an equivalent genius in the motion picture field, and this is how he got together with Thomas Ince. In the early 1920s, Thomas Ince was the hottest filmmaker of the day. Ince specialized in producing epic dramas and blockbuster spectacles. Hearst knew that Ince had the talent and the resources to get Marion Davies a leg up. Her career, that is. Ince came from a theatrical family. In 1911, he came out to the West Coast to make films uh, in what became known as Inceville, which was a tract of land where the sunset meets the ocean. Uh, and they made primarily Westerns and Civil War dramas uh, at that location for uh, a number of years. The Ince Studios at Washington and Ince uh, which is still standing, uh, kind of this Mount Vernon 
front to it, and um, they shot Gone with the Wind there. Thomas Ince has been um, credited with developing the studio system. He formalized the scripting process and uh, the shooting process so that uh, things became more streamlined. In November 1924, Hearst asked Thomas Ince to take over the production of Marion's films. Hearst and Ince uh, had uh, similar values. Uh, they were looking to uh, you know, push their own uh, careers, their own empire, and you know, developing a, a sense of influence that no human being had had up to that time. It was fateful. Their meeting, their entering into a business deal. I mean, how many people would have liked to have changed places with Ince when he signed that deal? Signing a production contract with Hearst made the 42-year-old Thomas Ince the envy of Hollywood, but not for long. Coming up, what tragic fate was waiting for Thomas Ince? Who was to blame? And how would this scandal haunt William Randolph Hearst until the day he died? Behind every star, there's a story. And the story of screen actress Marion Davies is a doozy. But she's not the only character in this little drama. The story also includes 27-year-old Marion's 61-year-old lover, newspaper tycoon William Randolph Hearst, and a celebrated Hollywood filmmaker named Thomas Ince. In 1924, Hearst intended to join forces with Ince to produce a series of movies for Marion. To seal the deal, Ince was invited to a party aboard the swanky Hearst yacht, the Oneida. So Ince, Hearst, and Davies headed out to sea and into Hollywood's scandalous history. Mark Wanamaker is a noted film archivist. It was Thomas Ince's birthday. So he was going to settle this, um, this whole affair of his birthday and the signing of the contract with killing two birds with one stone by having one party on the yacht with Hearst, Marion Davies, and a, and a group of invited friends. The group reportedly included Hollywood gossip columnist Luella Parsons and the silent screen's brightest star, Little Tramp, Charlie Chaplin. Hearst had invited Chaplin that weekend to observe firsthand the rumors that Marion Davies and Charlie Chaplin were having a bit of a fling behind uh, his back. Charlie Chaplin was, was pretty famous as, as a, a terrific lover, to be blunt about it. And, um, in the case of Marion Davies, she wasn't looking to marry Charlie Chaplin. She was looking to have a, a love affair with him, and, and vice versa. It was a time of prohibition. Um, here you could go out beyond the three-mile limit and drink legally. Here there was a lot of, uh, uh, you know, what we would consider wild times going on. The theories of what happened on that pleasure cruise have fed Hollywood's gossip grapevine for years. Here's the most popular version. Hearst woke up and found Marion wasn't in the bed and went looking for her and went into the galley and there from the back he spotted whom he thought was Charlie Chaplin. Thomas Ince and uh, Charlie Chaplin were very much alike physically. They both were men of, of, of slight builds, large heads of uh, big faces, uh, uh, curly uh, heads of salt and pepper hair. If you're buying this scenario, all her saw for sure was Marion and a man, presumably Chaplin, way too close to each other. And in the galley, late at night, with the particular lighting, it appeared that they, they were being intimate. Um, and Hurst was a great shot. He always carried a silver revolver with him. And he was so enraged and so jealous that he shot him. But it wasn't Charlie Chaplin laying there dead with a hole in his head. It was Thomas Ince, or so the story goes. And supposedly, there was a witness. The rumor is, is that uh, Luella Parsons, then uh, a, movie critic, a movie critic for her East Coast paper, this was her first trip to Los Angeles. She was on board, and while everyone else slept, she was the one who was the witness. She was the one who had the goods on, on Hearst. Uh, and she was the only person in Hearst employed to, to get a lifetime contract. Dina and Devet Ince, distant relatives of the victim, support this theory. I, I don't think he had any, uh, you know, set out mission to kill Ince. I think he, I think he had more of a, of a mission to get rid of Chaplin for having an affair with his girlfriend. 
The yacht returned to port in San Diego and Ince's corpse was reportedly brought to the train station on a stretcher. Onlookers were told that he was just under the weather, yeah, more like six feet under. Apparently the rumors of foul play uh, occurred when somebody saw uh, what he thought was blood on Ince's shirt front. There was a suspicion from the beginning that something had happened. It appears from the get-go that there was some type of cover-up going on with the type of investigation or or lack of investigation, I should say. Mm -hmm. One person saw the body after the supposed incident. Everything was put to bed at superhuman speed. He was cremated, Ince was cremated. It was over within four days. There was no body to be exhumed. There, there was no autopsy performed. Hearst denied any involvement. Davies wasn't talking. And Charlie Chaplin and Luella Parsons claimed they weren't even there. When we come back, the official account of what happened that bloody night and what killed Thomas Ince. A hot-tempered millionaire publisher, a movie star mistress, and a dead Hollywood producer. What about Colonel Mustard in the library with the lead pipe? In 1924, rumors ran rampant about the mysterious death of 42-year-old filmmaker Thomas Ince. 61-year-old media magnet William Randolph Hearst was the host of Ince's Bon Voyage party, and legend has it that Hearst, in a case of mistaken identity, put a bullet in Ince's head. However, the official scenario of what happened to Ince that weekend suggests instead a deadly case of indigestion. He was known as a workaholic. He had a heart condition. He had. Uh, an ulcer condition. He was not supposed to drink, he was not supposed to eat rich foods. Um, the understanding of ulcers and what caused them was not what it is today. Um, and uh, he disobeyed his doctor's orders. He partied hardy that, that night on his birthday, as probably any of us might. Inns was, uh, had turned blue at the table. In other words, he looked bad and he, was, he went to his stateroom where he immediately started vomiting blood quite a lot and then he had a coronary, a minor coronary, while he was vomiting, which is a common thing. And um, he, uh, of course, everyone was alarmed at this, very upset. He had to get off the boat and he decided to go home the next morning and take the train back to Los Angeles. With Ince was Hearst staff physician. On the way home, he uh, became worse. His companion called his family to bring his personal physician down. The doctor looked at him and did diagnose he did have a heart attack. He did, he is in very bad shape, and, um, but Ince felt that he could recuperate at home. That's why he was not brought to a hospital. And he continued on the train up to Los Angeles. He came home on a stretcher. He was put immediately to bed. He had visitors. He talked to his family. He talked to Charlie Chaplin, who did visit him. And he died on the morning of the 19th of natural causes. If Ince's death was caused by an ulcer and subsequently a heart attack, then why all the mystery about what took place on that yacht? I think it's quite interesting with Hearst being a publishing mogul uh, that the incident was kept you know, in such a small uh, story fashion. I would say that that's a very newsworthy uh, story uh, which happened in his presence. I mean, look how many more newspapers he would have sold if it was a huge headliner. I, that's why I don't understand. That's the business he was in. In those days, the coverage was going to be very discreet, first of all, because uh, you had prohibition. Liquor was prohibited. And of course, there was going to be plenty of liquor on board. I, I think it's likely there was a cover-up. A lot of people needed him, and no one wanted to see him in jail. Those convinced of a cover-up also charged that Ince's body was cremated and no autopsy was performed. Film historian Bob Burchard contends that no murder mystery exists. The early reports that there was blood on, on Ince's shirt front led the San Diego DA to contact the Los Angeles Sheriff's Office and the Los Angeles Police Department. And they made an immediate investigation on the day of his death. The body was examined in the presence of the studio manager. No marks, no wounds were found on the body. It's like a grain of sand in a cultured pearl. The pearl does not grow without that grain of sand. And this kind of legend does not 
grow without some kernel of truth there that instinct of indigestion is highly unlikely. There's really no one surviving who can say with certainty that that's the case. That may be true, but we have the next best thing. When we return an exclusive interview with Thomas Ince's granddaughter, we'll also hear from the granddaughter of William Randolph Hearst, Patricia Hearst, to finally expose the truth of that fatal weekend. The sudden death of 42-year-old hotshot filmmaker Thomas Ince on November 19, 1924, Rock Hollywood. And given the fact that Ince's dead or dying body was taken off the yacht of 61-year-old media mogul William Randolph Hearst, talk of foul play was inevitable. Well, few of the rumors were the whispers. Again, uh, that Hearst had a lot of enemies, but his enemies had to operate very quietly. It was also very hard to, to point a finger at Hearst. I think the idea that, that a man as rich and powerful as Hearst could uh, commit murder in a, in a, a crime of passion uh, was something that had a great deal of appeal to the popular imagination. Well, people still talk about the Ince Affair because of the importance of the participants. Um, as, as they were the absolute powerhouse people of the day. I believe Charlie Chaplin and Hearst panic, thinking that they're going to be accused of something, some impropriety or something. And, so, and they just chose the wrong way to go. Well, that might explain why Chaplin denied being on board the yacht that night, but why would Hearst be so secretive? Was Hearst nervous because he was serving alcohol? Maybe he served in bad alcohol, and maybe he really did have an attack and, and die. But if Ince wasn't shot by Hearst, then what about the blood on Ince's shirt? With his condition. Uh, it's quite possible that he spit up blood. Uh, there may have been blood on his shirt front. Uh, it may have, it, you know, it, this person may have seen it. It may have been purely speculation, too. Ince's widow, Eleanor, tried to dispel rumors that her husband was murdered by Hearst. That led to accusations that Eleanor was bought off. Part of the legend is that, that after Ince's death, Eleanor Ince received a, a, a payoff from Hearst, and it's totally untrue. Um, Ince was a, a, a very well-off individual. Um, she took over the operation of the studio uh, immediately after his death and sold the studio to Cecil B. DeMille uh, very shortly thereafter. If everyone who was supposedly on board the yacht is dead, who can we turn to for answers? Well, let's ask the descendant of the victim, Ince's granddaughter, Nancy. What killed Thomas Ince? He shouldn't have been eating, drinking, smoking to the extent that he did. And it just um, really hurt him and he um, felt sick. And that's when they took him to uh, the closest port, which was San Diego, to get him some help. Every account from his wife, his son, his granddaughter, his grandnephew, um, his personal driver, his studio manager, all say the same thing, that he died of a heart attack. Patricia Hurst, author of Murder at San Simeon and granddaughter of William Randolph Hurst, asked her parents about the Ince affair as a child. Her parents had very definite opinions about the incident. They said flatly, no, it's not true. It's ridiculous. Ignore them. They don't know what they're talking about. People have been saying these things for years. Just ignore it. They don't know what they're saying. My father remembers going into his room, seeing him, talking to him uh, as much as you can when somebody's sick. And um, I always remember my father telling me that he got to visit his father in the last few days. What about the quick cremation of Ince's body? Was it an attempt to destroy evidence of foul play? Contrary to popular opinion, Ince was not cremated immediately. His body was embalmed. Um, and uh, his, the cremation was something that he and his wife uh, had uh, decided on long before. It wasn't something that was done to cover anything up. Still not convinced? Nancy Ince offers this sworn affidavit was signed by Thomas Ince's studio manager. It states that Ince's body was examined before it was cremated and was found to be free of external injuries. There was absolutely nothing wrong, no 
injuries, no shot bullet holes or any of any kind. The sad part about it is, is that people forget all the wonderful work and innovations he did for the movie industry. Put this type of thing ahead of that. So it sounds like Ince really did die of natural causes and not at the hands of William Randolph Hearst. Hearst and Davies remained lovers until his death in 1951, but Hearst was never able to escape the sting of the Ince scandal. D.W. Griffith, the founding father of the motion picture industry, was a partner of Thomas Ince's, and Griffith throughout his life said that if you wanted to see a Hearst turn white, mention Thomas Ince's name. William Randolph Hearst made his millions selling scandal. It's kind of fitting that Hearst would be forever haunted by the one scandal he couldn't control. I guess what goes around really does come around. I'm A.J. Benza. Join me the next time we take a stroll down the flip side of the Walk of Fame.